Good morning. Good to be back with you. The uh, topic this morning is the hardest part of the Christian life. Now, this is not going to be a, a workout session. This is going to be an encouragement to you. Because I struggle with this area of the Christian life, and i got a feeling I'm not alone. Amen. In this microwave, uh, have it now, instant society we're in, one thing we struggle with is waiting. Nobody likes to be kept waiting. Mm -hmm. We have fast food. We have instant tea. We have instant popcorn. We have instant hot water. Uh, everything, you know, and, and one reason we go in debt because we don't want to wait. Mm -hmm. We want to have it now. And so uh, waiting is one of the hardest part of the Christian life. I remember as a little boy, Christmas time. For weeks leading up to Christmas, we would get the Sears and Roebuck Christmas catalog. I couldn't wait for it to arrive in the fall. <laughs> and I mean, I went through that thing over and over and over again. And thinking, if you know, if Santa Claus was just rich. My parents had already told me he wasn't. But if he was just rich, <laughs> and all the little things I wished I could have, then I'd have to narrow it down to a couple of things. And the day before Christmas, I would, my parents would tell me, First of all, wouldn't open any credit presents on Christmas Eve. I heard about a friend who did that, and I thought, Mom, Dad, that's a great idea. We can open presents on Christmas. Nope, not going to do it. Well, how about one present on Christmas Eve? Nope, not going to do it. I mean, that, that's pretty hard nose. But you know something? They knew that the power of anticipation was sometimes greater than the actual event. Mm -hmm. And so they built that anticipation up for all it's worth. Because not only no Christmas presents on Christmas Eve, also, don't get out of that bed in the morning until we come get you. Oh my goodness. I could not go into the living room until Christmas morning. So finally Christmas morning, I'm laying there at daybreak, just climbing the wall. Finally they come get us, oh, let's get up. All right, don't go in yet. We got to fix up the movie camera. Now back then, now you just flip a button or two and you got it. No, back then, open the case, get out the light bar, open the light bar, mount it on the camera, wind the camera up, plug it in, get it set up. Why didn't they do it the night before? I was laying in the hall sometimes literally pounding the floor with anticipation. Waiting is tough. Well, finally they'd open the door, and I'd come in to see my stuff, and guess what? Boom! Hit in the face with lights. You couldn't even see what you got. <laughs> so finally, you know, eyes would have to adjust. So I had to keep waiting and keep waiting and keep waiting. But boy, the thrill of it when I finally got to get in there and enjoy the blessings. Folks, the Christian life's a whole lot like that. We still struggle with waiting. If we can perfect that discipline in our Christian life, we'll have a whole lot more joy Amen. and a whole lot less stress because so often we want it to happen now. So let's turn in the God's Word and book of uh, Genesis chapter 8, verses 1 through 19. Noah has, they have been in the flood, they've been through the flood. The ark comes to rest on the mountain. Would you be a little anxious at that point after a hundred years building the thing and nearly a, you know months and months in the thing with animals? I'd be a little bit anxious. Well, let's open God's Word at Genesis chapter 8. Let's stand in on the reading of His Word. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind pass over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heaven were also stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained and the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month and the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month, and in the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Then he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. 
He also sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her feet, and she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. <laughs> so he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the, into the ark to himself. And he did what? Waited. Waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And no one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited. waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return to him again anymore. It came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked. And indeed, the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing, that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, whatever creeps on the <coughs> earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. May God add his blessing, read of his word. Thank you, may be seated. Whatever you're going through, Whatever you're facing, it may be school, it may be a job search, it may be some relational issue, something that you're going through, some trial that you're going through in life. I'm going to tell you, Noah had been through one big trial here. Mm -hmm. Just because he was in the will of God and just because he had the blessing of God did not mean it was easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wasn't on a cruise ship. <laughs> with a suite and a balcony and room service. He wasn't even on the one that got stranded out in the middle for five days. I mean, it wasn't even that nice. He was in an ark with animals and everything that goes with it. And he'd been there a very, very long time. <coughs> Centered in the will of God and blessed by God. And yet he had to keep waiting, keep waiting, and keep waiting. God, first point this morning, God is at work through the longest journey. Amen. Whatever is going on with you, He is at work through your longest journey. It says, so it came to pass at the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark which he'd made. He sent out a raven which kept going to and fro till the waters were dried up from the earth. I mean, that was the first thing he tried. And, um, you know, it didn't get any satisfaction there. And so he had to keep waiting. But God was at work. He was pulling the waters back even then. It was a process of time. He was at work. For centuries, man lived under the law. The law was there to teach us leading up to the time of Christ. From the time of the fall until the time of Jesus, many generations... But God was at work through every bit of it. It was a very long journey. It included 400 years of exile. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of years of practicing a sacrificial system that was complex and frankly cumbersome. But Galatians 3, 23, 25 says, Faith came, before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. Kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. The journey we're in can serve as a tutor now. There are things for us to learn while we're in the journey. God's at work even as we progress through the journey. I, I think for many of us who've been walking on a journey for several years together, and nearly all of you have known for a while, we have joined one another's journeys uh, 
And we have found that God's been at work through every bit of it and still is. And guess what? We still don't know where He's going to lead us. <laughs> but it's all part of a journey. And He's very much at work. In John 14, 2 and 3, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know, regardless of the journey we're on, we know where it ultimately ends if you know Christ the Savior. You know where it's going to end. And we know He's at work during the journey, developing us. He's busy preparing a place for us, but He's also busy preparing us. Now, we're fully prepared to go when the time comes because of what He did on the cross. But in the meantime, He's transforming us, making us more into His image. Second, there are several points this morning. I don't usually do multiple point messages that much anymore, but I did this morning. Your, your unfulfilled hope does not mean He's done. Keep watching. You got some disappointments in life? You may have some disappointments you hadn't counted on. Some people may disappoint you. Some people you love may have let you down. But it doesn't mean He's done in your life. Keep watching. He may have something greater for you down the road. He will even use those negative things in a positive way. He said he sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. The dove found no resting place, and she returned to the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. Mm -hmm. Folks, that's a picture of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're open to receiving, he's there, and he's at work. And Moses had a hope that the ground was dry and he'd have evidence of it. He didn't get it right then, did he? But the dove came back to him. God was still at work. But what did he do? He waited and he kept <laughs> watching. Luke 15, 20, um, the prodigal son had gone out away from the father, had been gone a long time. And But there came a point, said he rose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You see, the father was watching the whole time. The father is always watching. And folks, we ought to be always watching for the father's hand at work. Watching and waiting, knowing he's at work. And knowing that his timing is not our timing. I talked to a fellow minister this week, who's really a young minister, really having a rough time and, and uh, just life and needing, needing work and job prospects not coming through for him. And, you know, I talked about how God is always right on time. And he said, well, you know, even if he's not, he still rocks. And we were chatting online, and I said, well, you're right. The reality is sometimes our definition of on time varies a little bit from his. Mm -hmm. It may seem sometimes like he's late. The reality is he's not. And we're in a day when people are struggling more and more to see there's more hostility towards the Christian faith than we've ever seen. And it's, we're kind of shell-shocked, I think, as Americans, because we've not experienced this before. But folks, we're told this time will come, and there's a, there's a part of me that takes comfort in it because the line is getting so clearly drawn between mm -hmm. believers and unbelievers that evangelism is going to be easier. Not only that, it will purify the church. Pretenders won't stay when they're under heat. You know, heat draws out impurities. And so it'll purify the church, it'll strengthen the church, and it will make evangelism easier because if you go into a mission field, it's easier to do evangelism because the lost and the saved are so clearly different. Yes. And when they see a difference, they're drawn to it. And so... I'm not discouraged by persecution. I think that, that it's got some great things ahead for the church in, in that regard. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 says, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they'll turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Well, we're seeing a lot of that. Amen? Amen. Psalm 46, 10, the psalmist, David, who went through a lot of waiting, you know, he was anointed king as a boy, and then he ends up having to run for his life and hide out in a cave. Hand of God was on him every step of the way. Was that fun? No. Attempts on his life, everything else. 
He said, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Folks, I'm believing God for a revival in the land. And I believe that things may have to get worse before they get better, in a way. I don't like them to get bad, but, in, but there's a part of me that, that finds hope in that. And so, keep watching. Our unfulfilled hopes does not mean he's done. Second, third, take heart from any first fruits that he gives you. You're going to find that as we go through the journey, he will show up in little ways along the way. Just to give you a little encouragement here and there. Uh, a card from a friend, a phone call from someone. Uh, little ways that God will show up and encourage you. Take heart from that. In uh, reading this morning, it says, He waited yet another seven days and again sent out the dove. And the dove came to him from the evening. Behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. You see, he found encouragement in that. That's the first fruits of the earth coming back to life. Yes. And it brought him encouragement. Take encouragement from those things. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 and 20 says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most pitiful, pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead, has become the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. You see, we don't serve just a crucified Christ. We serve a living Christ. Amen. That's why we, 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 we look at an empty cross because, and an empty tomb because our Jesus lives. Yes. The first fruits of more to come. And because He lives, we live. Amen. If you know Him as Savior and Lord and your trust is in Him. So take heart from the first fruits that He grants you. The life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. Cling to that as encouragement in your own life. And cling to those first fruits that He gives you along the way. Those little things that encourage you. Because He keeps showing up even while you're waiting <coughs> for the victory. Fourth, if your hope is in Christ, time is on your side. Now, you know, life is not Burger King. You don't get to have it your way. It's not a drive through line. You know, you ever get aggravated in a drive through line when you're in line 10 minutes? I know I've said that line a dozen times. I thought this was fast food. <laughs> You know, I could have gone to a sit-down restaurant and almost got waited on this quick. If your hope is in Christ, time is on your side because He owns time. Mm -hmm. He created time. Right. And Noah, my goodness, man was over 600 years old. <laughs> and God was doing these great and mighty things in his life. And I'm sure, I mean, that's a pretty long time to wait. I haven't waited quite that long. Dave has, but I have yeah. <laughs> no, no. None of us, none of us can even fathom that kind of years. Yeah, I can. I only pick on people I love. Now I'm like pick on all of you. Times on your side. It says, as it came to pass in the 601st year, the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked. And the ground was dry. That means the water was basically gone off the ground. But what I interpret this, it was still soggy. It was just barely gone. Because, you see, that was the first month, first day of the month. In the second month, on the 27th day, that's another 57 days. <clears throat> let's pull the cover off. Oh, the water's down. Yeah, well, let's just wait another 57 days and we can get off. Imagine how that go over today. Anybody here ever been on a cruise? When you get back into port, and they have you line up, you know, get to the station where you sit and you wait. Does anybody get it anxious? <coughs> What's everybody doing? Got their cell phones out, calling. I don't know when we got, I hope we get off soon. And, I mean, everybody's anxious. Oh, well, it'll just be uh, another 57 days and then we can get off. I mean, these were people just like us, folks. <coughs> but they had learned something about waiting. 
time is on our side. David was anointed king as a child. He was told he was to be king. So did he walk into town and claim a crown and take No, he went back to the sheep. Thank you, dear. When I was uh, first called to preach, I talked to my pastor, and I said, you know, I know the Lord's calling me to preach. He said, well, I do too, brother. You're very supportive. I said, well, you know, how do I make myself available? Do I need to make some brochures and send them out to pastors? And, you know, how do, how do I do this? He said, well, what are you doing now? I said, building houses. He goes, go back to building houses. Well, but I, I want to make myself. He goes, God knows you're available. I love that man, but that's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> I'm ready to go. David went back to his sheep. And that's what the story he told me that day. He goes, David was anointed king, went back to the sheep. He said, you've surrendered to your call. Go back to what you were doing and wait for God. Mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't too long after that God started opening some doors. But the point is, time's on our side. That was, my goodness, 25 years, over 25 years ago. No, 27 years ago. <laughs> Still at it. And, uh, you know, no, I've never gotten to preach in stadiums full of thousands of people like Billy Graham. But he never got to preach in Red Bull and Springs. <laughs> you know, God has his plan for us each. And time is on our side. He's not done. Romans 8, 22-24 says, We know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, for the redemption of our body. For we were saved in hope that is seen is for... Uh, I'm sorry, we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Why does one still hope for what he sees? Yeah. In other words, we can't see salvation. People say, well, can you see God? No, but I tell you what, I can tell he's there. You can't see the wind either. You can't see electricity, but go grab a hot wire. You'll believe it's there. <laughs> you know, he's there, and he's at work. And... You know, I, I can't relate necessarily to moms, but I know when we had our first child, you know, uh, labor was about 18 hours long. And I know it wore me out. And so, you know, it had to be too tough on her. So there was anticipation. Anxious to see it happen. Anxious for the delivery to come. Jeremiah 14, 22 says, are there among... Are there any among the idols of the nations that can cause rain or the heavens to give showers? Are you not he, O Lord our God? Therefore we will wait for you since you have made all these. Amen. I know that I'm anxious to see God do some works here in a great way. But I don't want to try to run ahead of him. I've done plenty of that in my life. I know we struggled back in May. The elders felt like we need to move. We need to get out of this basement and get in a location where we can reach some people. And what well, we were struggling in May of last year. And we went and found a space and looked at it, and the lease just didn't work out. And I didn't feel like in good conscience we could sign it. It would expose it. It was just a bad situation. And so we stopped short of doing it. And we went back and we waited several more weeks. <coughs> And then the Lord made clear he opened a door. Mm -hmm. Much better situation, much more affordable, much better location. Time is on our side when we wait on him. But lastly this morning, when he says act, act. Mm -hmm. God spoke to Noah, said, go out of the ark, you and your wives and your sons, your sons' wives. They waited a long time. This is managed me in downtown. <laughs> they waited a long time. But when it was time to act, God said act, and it was time. Mm -hmm. But wait for his timing. Yes. And he will show up. Acts 2.1 says, 
when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. You realize they prayed for 40 days? Can you imagine about day 27 going, man, how long is this going to go on? <laughs> they didn't know it was going to be 40 days. God did. Mm -hmm. But you keep trusting and you wait. Because he's at work in you during that time. When we decided to move to seminary, I, I had the business closed and was working in a lumber yard. But our house hadn't sold yet. Marty hadn't secured a job in Texas yet. Uh, we didn't have housing down there. I mean, there were a whole lot of things. We were waiting. We were waiting on the Lord to get pave the way for us. And I was at the lumber yard working there because we had closed the business. And Marty called me on the phone and she shared that she said, here's what the Lord showed me in Scripture this morning. How the priests were carrying the ark and the waters of the river stopped only after their feet touched the water. In other words, if God had moved, they would have drowned. They had to step before they saw the manifestation. I was waiting for our house to sell. It hadn't sold yet. I said, sound like we got to book our move. And she said, I think so too. It was time to act. Didn't make logical sense, but we did it anyway. How sold three weeks later, after we'd moved. If it hadn't sold that month, we would have been in trouble. We couldn't afford another note. But God acted. When Paul was blinded, saw the light on the road to Damascus and he was blinded, he waited three days. And Ananias came and restored his sight. And then asked him, he said, why are you waiting? Acts 22, 15, 16, he said, For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I will submit to you this morning, what are you waiting for to tell God <laughs> yes? I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. That's the first step is commitment. And now is the time of salvation. Now is the time to make that commitment. What are you waiting for? Wait for Him to move. And in a whole lot of life, it's hurry up and wait. But when He says act, act. And today, I believe He's telling you, time to act. Father, we praise Your name and thank You for Your love and Your care. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful examples you give us throughout your living word of how you are indeed at work. You indeed have a plan. You indeed use just normal, everyday people to fulfill your purposes. So, Father, our prayer would be that today we would say, yes, Lord. We would act. We would not wait any longer to make a commitment, a true commitment. Father, glorify yourself in us. We ask in Jesus' name. And God's people said,